beginning around verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Take up your cross and follow me. He said to them all, we think of the cross uh, being the cross of Jesus, but here he broadens it to include all of his, his disciples. You take up your cross. Uh, one commentator said, marching to your execution, shamefully carrying the heavy horizontal beam of your death instrument through the midst of a jeering mob. Craig Keener. This means laying down all of our own. Jesus laid down everything. And uh, his, his life, all his dreams, all his, uh, even and the night before he's saying, Lord, is there another way to do this, you know, at Gethsemane. But finally he came to the place, okay, we're going to do this. And he did it. And uh, he, not, he calls us to do the same thing, to give up our own desires, to give up our own life for what he wants to do with it, to uh, kiss our pride goodbye, our way of doing things, and surrendering everything to what Christ demands of us. I used to really uh, harp on these verses many years ago, make a lot of enemies, and some people joined the church and said, oh boy, this guy really preaching it good, you know, and, and other people are saying, well, well, that's a little bit, he doesn't have any love. And, uh, but I emphasized a lot about the cross and uh, our life isn't our own. It's as simple as that. You're with me today, Jeff, you're looking everywhere except up here. Anyway, I can do a Jesus too, you know, and put you on this. Anyway, I'm teasing. And um, when we d decide to be a Christian, we set all of our decisions aside. We, our plans for the future. I had a few different plans for the future that did not include being a preacher. And, even, and especially being a pastor. Once I became a Christian, I said, I could see becoming an evangelist like Jimmy Swagger, play a lot of music and, and travel around. That sounds cool, that, I like that. And uh, the Lord called me to be a pastor. I said, pastor, that's boring. And, but I've loved every minute of it, of course. When you surrender to what God wants, it's, it's a fit. It's a fit because that's what he made you for. But you do have to surrender. You do have to nail yourself to the cross, as it were. And uh, if you're ashamed of him and his words, yep, he will be ashamed of you before the Father. If you desire to save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life for his sake, you'll save it. And that's what I learned. I didn't get to be a rock musician. I didn't get to be a scientist. I got to be a pastor and I found my life, praise God. And I'm sure you have similar testimonies. Next is the transfiguration which is right after the verse that many shall not see death until they see the kingdom of God. Probably he was referring to the transfiguration. It's a, they, they saw a type of what it's going to be like in glory, a, a preview as it were. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up 
on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, the cloud came and overshadowed them. It's the, it's the Shekinah cloud of God. It's fiery and dark at the same time. It's the same cloud that came upon them on, uh, on Mount uh, Exodus Mount, Mount Sinai. And uh, now they're on uh, Mount Hermon, I think, one of the other uh, Gospels says. And it's right nearby anyway. And... Uh, this, the cloud comes down and God speaks this is my beloved son hear him that's what he did at Ex in Exodus too he, the cloud came down on the mountain and God spoke from there so this is kind of a cool deal and when the voice that sees Jesus was found alone but they kept quiet and told no one in those days of any of the things they had seen Like I said, this uh, verse 28 was probably, or verse, uh, yeah, 27, that uh, fulfilled that you, this, you will see the kingdom of heaven probably, as I said, uh, uh, not a literally, not literally fulfilled, but a, a type in the immediate context. And anyway, <clears throat> and Peter said, let's build three Tabernacles. Peter knew how to build tabernacles. Every year at the Feast of Tabernacles, you had to, the males of the house would go and build a tabernacle in the backyard. And so they knew how to do it. And there's three of them up there with them. They could have built three tabernacles. But uh, Moses, well, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 18 says, and I, I'm just going to, I don't have it uh, written down in front of me, and, but uh, you, you can trust me on this. That there's going to come a prophet after me that's going to be even, even greater than me, and he's the one that you shall all listen to. Remember that prophecy? Should we look there? Deuteronomy. Numbers 15, how about Deuteronomy 15? Come on, Kim. Fifteen what? Eighteen, I believe. No, that's not it. Maybe it's eighteen fifteen. And if it ain't that, then I just blew it. I shouldn't have brought it up. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet yeah, like here me. here it is. That's the one. From your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. Yeah, uh, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like me, Moses speaking, from your midst and from, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And that's exactly what God is saying here. Him you shall hear. You got Moses the original prophet of the Old Testament. You've got Elijah, who was to come before the great day of the Lord, and, and Jesus says in another gospel, I believe Mark, he says, and he's gonna, <laughs> and Elijah is. But here's the one. You don't build three tabernacles, just one, for the one who is, he's the one you hear, just as you heard uh, the voice of Jehovah on the mountain. Okay. Any questions or comments on that? Yes. Yes. Every time they go to pray with Jesus, they fall asleep. <laughs> I never noticed that they were asleep on this one, too. And it's like, yeah. all the time. 
Well, watching somebody else pray when you're tired and you've been walking all day isn't very exciting. Well, aren't they <laughs> supposed to be praying too? I mean, you Well, know. they were probably trying, but they just kept nodding off because they weren't in the spirit. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. I wasn't in the spirit when you came in tonight. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, two weeks ago I uh, worked all night and I just could not get the energy to come to church and so we didn't have institute class. Last night I didn't work, but the devil stinking stole most of the night's sleep and I can't believe this. I got up, I had a glass of milk, tried to do everything, went back to bed. Anyway, I got about two hours sleep and just a stinking demonic attack. But I'm here, praise God, and God's going to move in, in our weakness he's made strong. Amen? Amen. All right. Oh, I'm in Deuteronomy still. Glory to God. I will catch up here today. I promise. <clears throat> and when the voice had ceased, they were found. Jesus was found alone. They kept quiet and they went mm -hmm. down. And it happened on the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, Look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him and suddenly cries out and convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and departs. And it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, he says, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. He's rebuking the disciples there. Now three of them were with him. And in a little bit they start having an argument about who's the greatest because he takes those three with them on a few different occasions. They're probably thinking, we must be the greatest. If we were down here, we would have cast this demon out. But these other guys can't cut it, you know. But uh, he's just kind of frustrated with them all. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. The story is a little longer in, in some of the accounts where the fathers, where Jesus said, just believe, and, uh, and we can see him delivered. And he said, uh, help, I believe, help my unbelief. And... Uh, Jesus is, like I said, Jesus is kind of frustrated with the guys because they should have been able to do this. But this, the devil can buffalo you sometimes. And uh, when you have a particular mean, evil spirit, it can intimidate you. I've been there uh, talking to somebody just this past week that was in a situation like that, had a demon-possessed lady who was locked herself in the bathroom, screaming, carrying on, and... Uh, and this person, the, the individual that called me as well, has cast out demons in the past, but this one was so big, so boisterous, they can whittle away at your faith, and all of a sudden, you're, it's not leaving. No, and it's not leaving. Well, maybe it's not then, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, they, uh, we have power and authority over all the power of the enemy. But sometimes when they come on really strong, it can be very intimidating. And that's apparently what happened in this case. Matthew mentions that he was an epileptic um, and this total self-destructive behavior of demonized persons is uh, especially severely demonized. A lot of people have a demon that only shows up once in a while when they lose their temper or when they get hurt or what, you know, various emotional traumas and stuff can make a demon manifest. But uh, somebody in this situation, when the demon takes over to that extent, it can be very, like I said, very intimidating. It doesn't mean that every epileptic is demonized. It, uh, uh, demons can manipulate the nervous system, apparently. And uh, like I said, the self-destructive behavior is very common. And uh, Jesus cast it out. Anything 
more on that one. And they were all amazed, verse 43, at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. He had uh, predicted that just uh, 20 verses earlier, too, that he was going to be uh, suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, and be killed. And they're just, uh, boy, I don't get it. You're, you're the most popular thing going in uh, Israel today. Why would, 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 why would one of us give you up? Why would the chief priests kill you and stuff? Uh, that became obvious as the years went, as months went by. And a dispute arose among them as to which would be the greatest. Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you will be great. And again, like I said, because he's taken the three, James and John and Peter, on a couple of occasions with him, they're probably thinking that they're, uh, they might be the greatest of the disciples. And the others are getting jealous. And, you know, you're going to have that rivalry when, in any situation, even with good uh, spiritual guys. But um, he says, no, we're going to be humble here. He who is the humblest is going to be the one who is the greatest. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. I wonder if they were changing the subject. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. <laughs> That's what it seems like to me. Yeah, like they're switching the blame or something. Right? Yeah, it's, well, okay, now that you rebuked us here, well, have you, what about this guy? What about this? We don't even know him, and he's out there using your name to cast out demons. And Jesus says, good for him. Uh, he later on says, he that is not for us is against us. But it's also true that he that is not against us is for us. So, and he, especially when he's uh, invoking the name of Jesus, and it apparently is working, he wasn't even instructed by Jesus to do this yet, and uh, he's already doing it. So that's, we, we don't want to hear any more about him. Okay. He had faith. Hmm? He had faith. Yeah, he had faith, exactly. He saw Jesus doing it. He probably saw the, the 12 going out and doing it too and said, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And that's when they saw him. He was doing it too. Well, you're not one of us. Well, I'm still working for him. <laughs> Okay. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem deep prejudice between the Samaritans and who worshipped at Bethel, their, their particular uh, temple there, and uh, the Jews who wor worshipped at Jerusalem. So they saw he was going to Jerusalem, and uh, you're not welcome here in this town. And his disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, this is where they got the name, saw this and they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? We can cast out demons. We can probably call down fire too. 
But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of a spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And he went to another village. I had some notes on this particular thing. And Ah, oh, here I found him. It says, give a very brief his history of the Jewish Samaritan animosity. Does everybody from feel they understand that a little bit? Yes. Um, the Samaria, if we look on the map, is what was to the ocean side there. Uh, what was part of the northern kingdom when Judah and and the northern kingdom were separated, and there was two kingdoms of Israel. And uh, the Assyrians came along and wiped out the northern kingdom. A hundred years later, the Babylonians came along and deported everybody in the uh, Judah that could walk. They left the old people, and like Jeremiah, I mentioned that, I think, Sunday, he was left there because, you know, well, you're a friend of ours if you're an enemy of the king here, so. Anyway, and then after, uh, during the Persian Empire, <laughs> three empires in a row, Assyria, Babylon, and Persia, and they each took over the land of the empire before them. So Persia overtook the Babylonian kingdom, and that was when uh, the king said, you can go back to Israel in the book of Ezra, you can go back to Israel and build your temple in Jerusalem and pray for me. I'm, I'm going to let you guys go. Anybody who wants to go back. So Zerubbabel led uh, several thousands of people back to Israel on a mass journey. Uh, basically the same journey that uh, Abraham had taken all those many hundreds of years earlier. And uh, now the whole nation is coming. As many as went, wanted to go. Anyway... And they got there. And then in the meantime, the northern kingdom had been filled with Gentiles and Jews. And they began to uh, intermingle. And they weren't pure Jews. They were half Gentile and half Jews. And they lived in Samaria. And so they became the Samaritans. And they were not received by the fully Jewish people. It's, the Bible is very racist when it comes to this. <laughs> anyway. Uh, as, as far as the lessons being taught in the Old Testament, of course the Bible isn't racist to, to, in the Gospel. But anyway, um, so there became this animosity between the two, and they worshipped in two different temples and everything by the time of Christ. And a good Jew would usually cross the Jordan River and come down on the eastern side and then go over to Jerusalem when they, to, to avoid going through Samaria at all. But Jesus wants to get down there a little quicker, so he goes right through. And he also wants to see if some Samaritans want to listen to him, too. They did on his way up initially a few years earlier in the book of John. You read that in the first couple of chapters. Anyway, so this time they rejected him. Uh, the Samaritan temple was destroyed around the second century B.C., it was uh, actually at Mount Gerizim. And the uh, Jerusalem temple was uh, still, in, still there in the days of Jesus. And actually it, wasn't to it was uh, destroyed in 70 AD when the Romans took over. But uh, they managed to rebuild it and, and uh, it was finally totally destroyed early in the uh, second century AD. So, anyway, there's your little history lesson on the Sons of Thunder and Samariti, Samaritans and all that good stuff. All right, verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 
And then he said to another, follow me. But he said, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Another said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid the farewell to them who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This seems really stern. Like if you, you know, uh, can I say goodbye to my family before I leave? No. But that's these individuals. He knows their hearts. He wouldn't say that to everybody. But say, uh, I want to be your disciple. I'll follow you wherever you go. Uh, I don't have anywhere to, to rest and lay my head. Can you live with that? Well, no, I thought you were going to get the best accommodations in every city. You're the big guy, you know. And, and uh, no, I, I don't think we want to follow you after all. And uh, let me go bury my father. His father wasn't dead. He wanted to stay and care for the family while father was in his old age and care for his father and take care of the family until his father died. And then I'll follow you. Um, he did, Jesus doesn't even have that much time left. And so he says, let the dead bury the dead. And the final guy, you know, he just, uh, he says he wants to say goodbye, but uh, Jesus saw through his heart and he said, you're just making a, he's probably making a good impression out here in front of the guys. I'm going to follow you. Let me say goodbye. And then he says goodbye and never does follow him. And Jesus busted him on it before he even did it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. well, what, what does let the dead bury the dead? Um, I mean, obviously that's if you're, not possible. Let the, those who are dead in sin take care of those who are dead in sin. If you want to be a kingdom follower, you follow me. We're alive. That's how I interpret it anyway. Because uh, Paul says before we came to Christ, we were dead in sin. So that's how I see that. Then how can the dead bury the dead? You know what I mean? The literally dead. So I'm going to take a Pepsi sip here. All right, Luke chapter 10. I didn't know if I was going to get this far or not today, but we are booking along real good. Uh, this is one of my favorite chapters. In chapter 9, he sends out the 12. In chapter 10, he sends out the 70. And I mentioned this last week, but I'll mention it again this week. The 12 represents to me, uh, and as I see it, the 12 represents the 12, the leadership. They're, they're the apostles. And he sends them out to do the ministry. And the word number, and the number 12 is a number of governmental perfection in biblical numerology. 70 is the number of totality. And so he sends out the 70, and they go out and do the same thing. And, and I think that's the whole body of Christ, the totality of the body of Christ. The leadership goes out and does the stuff, but not just the leadership, which is what most people have been taught from Catholic and Lutheran churches. All you have to do is come and throw a little money in the offering. The minister will do all the ministering. Wrong. And that's what the, the, the 12 and the 70 is saying. Yes, the 12 do it, but the 70 do it also. And obviously 70 is more than 12. So most of the work is done not by the preachers, but by the people. I don't know as many people as you do. I can't go around to talk talking to strangers, but they're not strangers to you. You can talk to them. And if I had, if the minister had to go out and evangelize every person that comes to church, that would get uh, a pretty small church. And uh, I'm proud to have led a whole bunch of you to the Lord over the years, but uh, at the same time. I got to lead them to the Lord because a lot of you brought them to church and I just got the glory of praying with them. Anyway, let's read about 70. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Now remember, he's on his way to Jerusalem and so he's sending them out ahead of him 
when he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his har harvest. Uh, it's impossible to miss the conclusion that Jesus' heart is on evangelism. If you really, you know, we talk about apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Jesus was the epitome of all of those. He's the apostle of the whole Christian church, not the Pope. <laughs> Jesus. And he, his prophecies are accurate to the T. He's a prophet. He's an evangelist. He's a pastor. He's the good shepherd. And, uh, but evangelist is what sticks out the most, because that's what he did. He went around preaching the gospel. And uh, I, that, that is the heart of any true born-again Christian. I have a quote that I wrote down by Oral Roberts some years ago. He says, The sick, the dying, the poor, the brokenhearted, the desperate few of these look to the des the desperate few of these look to the church for help. More and more I was convinced that the great bulk of our time and effort in the church was spent on ourselves. Meetings for church members, prayers for church members, church for church people. And uh, that's what made him decide to be an evangelist. The call of God on his life too. For a while, he, he caught it from a lot of uh, corners, and, and maybe some of it was deserved with his extravagancy and such, but um, he was legitimately called by God, legitimately healing the sick and, and doing the stuff before the, there was a charismatic movement and a lot of other people were doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I said, Luke organize, organizes it here, so in chapter 9, the 12 are sent out, in chapter 70, in chapter 10, the 70. There's a different callings. First Corinthians chapter 12, some are, you know, some have th this gift and that gift and such like, but every one of us is gifted in spreading the gospel. Go ye into all the world. Ye is a plural of you. Not just you who are called to do that, but every one of ye go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that doesn't shall be damned. But they have to at least have a chance to hear. That's why we went to India. That's why we went to Milwaukee in the first place. We went down there and we said, you know, the whole south side of the city is all Catholics. You've got your Hispanic Catholics, You've got your Italian Catholics and your Polish Catholics. Uh, it, Milwaukee is a divided city. It was then, and I think it still is. It, it just slightly changed. The north side is uh, Protestant, black and Protestant Germans. The south side is Catholic. And, the, and 94 is a dividing line between the two of them. And the, the south side is Puerto Ricans and Mexicans and Polish with your handful of uh, Italians and Irish. Anyway, so all the Catholics are down there. And I said, there's no evangelical church. And I mean, we drove through there several times. I said, there isn't any Bible church on the whole south side. And we did find out there was a little one down in the corner, but it wasn't doing too well. Anyway, so that's what brought us to Milwaukee. We said, well, we We've done stuff here in St. Paul already. People were mad at us. Call me up out of there and say, what are you doing? You're, what are you leaving those sheep in the wilderness? I said, we got, they're not in the wilderness. We got a great church here and good, good elders and stuff. And I, I gotta go do something else. And anyway, so we did that. And then when we were there, um, I believe Keith Green did an article on India in one of his newsletters. And I thought, look at this. And so I did some research about it, and I found out that in North India, including Delhi, the biggest city, or now uh, one of the biggest cities in the world, tied with Mexico and Tokyo, Yokohama, for the largest city in the world. Anyway, one out of every 10,000 people was a born-again Christian. Estimation. 
one out of every 10,000. The missionaries have been going there since 1792 when William Carey first went to Bengal. And in South India, there's a lot of Christians. In Bengal, there's a few more Christians. But in North India, the Hindu heartland, the India the, of the Indus River and the Taj Mahal and everything, that one out of every 10,000 people is a Christian. So somebody's got to do something about that. Well, we, we did our part, and Brother Emmanuel's taken it from there, and we've got churches in Rajasthan, Delhi, Haryana, all the way over to Bihar that Emmanuel visits on a regular basis, and pastors in charge of each fellowship, of course. But uh, praise God. Amen. That we're supposed to be doing this is what we're supposed to be doing. I would like to say, well, I built it all. I, I, we kicked it off for three years. But since then, it's just multiplied, and that's what it's supposed to be. Welcome to class, sir. I just got done. I, think yeah, I believe it. I believe morning. it. Yeah. I know you're always here as soon as you can make it. So, we're in Luke chapter 10. Okay, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money, bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. Uh, by the way, in the other Gospels, uh, he gives this spiel in, uh, when he sends 12, but the others don't include the sending of the 70. And so rather than be redundant, Luke puts it on the, and in this section instead of the previous chapter. It's the same message either way, whether you're the 12 or the 70. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And don't bring anything extra, no, no extra money, no knapsack, no extra sandals. And don't even greet anyone along the road. I haven't noticed that one before. You're, you're on a mission. Don't be interrupted. And whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Did you know that? When you say, peace be with you, and they don't receive it, it comes right back at you. <laughs> you bless yourself. I like that. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go out there and bless a lot of <laughs> unlovely people that don't want to be blessed and get all that coming back on me. Anyway. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Then you look like a busybody. And uh, when did I mention this? Last week. Last week in this class, yeah. Anyway, yeah, then you look like a busybody, and it, it just gives way to criticism and such. Um, I was going to say something else, but I lost my track there. Oh, and eat whatever's set before you. We had a rule in India that if anybody came from uh, visiting from America, and we had... Oh, I suppose six or seven people came over over the time that we were there. And uh, we said, you will eat what is put before you and you will ask for seconds. Because they have gone out and borrowed money and, and killed the fatted calf, literally, to, to buy a chicken, to buy, to make the best meal they can possibly have. And this always happened like the first time we came to a village or something. After that, we just had tea and biscuits afterwards. But when the, the first time we'd visit there, you make all your first impressions then. And you've got every neighbor in that house crammed into this little house. You've got about 30 people in a little living room. And, uh, and they make a lovely meal for you. But it's hot, it's spicy, it's Indian, it's not a hamburger. <laughs> It might even be lamb or something that most Americans don't like, especially hot and chill. And, and, oh, and I, I just give them a dirty look. And I say, you remember the rules, man. <laughs> One time we had uh, Lena and Peter with us. And Peter was sitting down next to me, and he had this, they just had rice at this particular time. It wasn't our first visit, visit but there was meat and a lot of chilies in the rice. And uh, what were you putting we on We didn't it? know that there were chilies in the rice. Oh, yeah. 
it was they turned the lights on. We kept telling them to eat the rice because it would cool yeah, his mouth down. Yeah, if you eat the rice, it'll cool, but they had to sprinkle green, when they hot When they turned the light, the somebody brought in another light, and you could see the rice had a green tinge to it. And so it was, the poor kid and was Peter sitting, was sitting there crying. On, the, on the floor next to me in a chair, just crying. <laughs> but he was a little soldier, and he did it, you know. Anyway. But uh, that was our rules, you know, because you, you cannot offend these people. They are given their level best to give, you know, to you, and you better like it. And of course, after we grew to love it ourselves. I tell the Earl Quinnell story. He, <laughs> do you want Should to? I, or do you want to? Go ahead. Well, he was, they were at a, in a village, and, and again, it was one of the first times there. And uh, it's something, they gave him something. Some what he thought was horrible, whatever. The mush. And uh, anyway, so so the lady went out of the room and just left them eating. And he had a window behind him, and he went like this and threw his food out the window. And the lady came back, and they were very gracious and all that. And they went on. We're going to get up and go to the meeting. And he turned around, and there was a screen on the window. <sighs> And there was and this food, food was hanging, hanging and there, from the and and you know something like that happens. You never do it again. You 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 <laughs> never do it again. I mean, you know. <laughs> I think the problem with me sleeping last night could be coming down with a cold or something. Okay. <laughs> Heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its street and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. And basically what he's doing is giving strict social guidelines so that they don't offend people unnecessarily. It's one thing if you offend people with the word and they take offense at the gospel, but they better not take offense at you. You're the messenger of the gospel. You have to be upright in as much as you know how to be. And uh, if they don't receive you, go to the next town. There's plenty of unsaved people out there. Sounds a little bit stern, you know, but uh, there's a lot of people yet to win. But I've uh, also seen people that blame the people for their own shortcomings as a minister. Well, people these days are just not interested in evangelical Christianity. Well, gosh, they were when we talked to them. You know, and not all the time, of course, but I mean, uh, you can't use, if you're, if you're not cutting it, it's not because the people are hard sometimes, it's because you're just not reaching them right, or you're, which is very easy for a Christian to do because some of us have spent so long since we were in that lifestyle that we find it hard to relate and, you know, unless we have, you know, a secular job is a great thing to have, isn't it? For that, you know, you, you meet a lot of people and you stay in touch. But uh, for a minister, it can be really uh, tricky because you're in this holy place all the time. You're at church, you're in your office, you're studying, it's always the word. And uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me was to get that driving job about 20 years ago. As I've been out there listening to the truck drivers talk like truck drivers talk and, and witnessing to them and meeting a lot of people along the way. So, all right, let a few to the Lord too, praise God. And the 70 returned with joy, verse 17. What happened to verse 12? Where, where did I miss that? Mm hmm. Whatever city, the very dusty, I read, oh, ah, that's what you, I missed. But I say to you that it will become, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. 
Woe to you, Chorazin! Then he names some of the cities that have already rejected him. Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, that's where Jesus' headquarters were, you will be brought down to Hades. Because he was there all the time, and, and uh, people did come to the house, but they, it, they, it should have been a revival of the whole city. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Some people think that's really not fair with all the good religions out there. How can rejecting Jesus make God reject you? Well, Jesus was the one he sent. The other guys invented their stories. Someone was talking to me about Muhammad this week, and, and I again don't remember the context now, but he, he was asking me questions about Muhammad, and well, didn't he hear from God? I mean, did he get visions or not? Well, he said he got visions. His wife said he was demonized. He, he went out in a cave and, and claimed to get a lot, of, a lot of visions, and then he wrote the Quran, which is plagiarized from all sorts of different uh, books, including the Bible. and. Uh, and original things too, of course. But his wife wouldn't talk to him. She said he is totally demon possessed. He's just crazy. He's out of his mind. Uh, when he first started preaching, he was rejected outright by everybody he talked to. And uh, in his lifetime, he was not very successful. But the stories spread and, and things happened. And of course, today it's a, a very big religion. But he wasn't sent by God. Buddha wasn't sent by God. Buddha was probably well-meaning. I studied Buddha too. And uh, he was a, a sixth century BC monk, a Hindu monk. And he just uh, found Hinduism lacking and he just devoted himself all the more to Hindu practices of meditation and all this misses. And But he wasn't sent by God. Jesus was sent by God. And if the world hasn't heard it, my goodness, it's 2,000 years ago. It's about time we got on the job. The 70 returned with joy, verse 17, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. This is one of my favorite scriptures ever, Luke 10, 17. And I think everybody should memorize it. Behold, I give unto you authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's not hard. I give you authority over his power. He has more power than we do. He can kill people. He can do all sorts of things uh, that devils and angels can do. But we have more authority, which is power that is given to us, somebody else's power. Uh, we're enabled to use. There's a word for it, and it's just not coming tonight. But anyway, authorized. Authority. Authorized. Ta-da. I saw Satan fall like lightning. The ministry of these 70 as they went forth dealt, dealt a tremendous blow to those cities that they went to. And Satan lost, lost some status in the spiritual realm in those places. And we have tremendous authority in Christ. And we, we need a revelation of it individually. I can preach a sermon on it. I might do it this week. I don't know. But I mean, just there's 
so much there, but we have to get it and do it. But don't get all excited about the power, guys. It's about humble people getting saved. We rejoice because your names are written in heaven, and my name didn't deserve to be written in heaven, and yours didn't either. But God was gracious. I have been thinking this week, and I, I've, I haven't been feeling really 100% on my game. And uh, as a result, I've been praying and reading, and, and uh, but I've been thinking about Becky and I before we came to Christ, and, and uh, remembering that we were really sinners. You know, we all were. But, you know, we were... When I met her, she was already a sinner. She didn't, she didn't need me to teach her how to do this, that, and the other thing, you know. And, and together, for the first six months that we were together, uh, we lived a bad life. But then Jesus saved us, praise God. Mm -hmm. And it's been so totally wonderful since then. All right. Verse 23, where am I at here? 21. 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Boy, I love that. And then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see, or I tell you that many for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. We enjoy privilege and power that the Old Testament saints only dreamed of. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God would come upon them at times and they, you know, the heroes and they, you know, do mighty things. But we have the privilege of that power and authority abiding with us. Amen. We can do it any time. Yeah. If we're in the Spirit, we can see every open door and every time. We, we should be out there uh, idealistically speaking, every day just winning people to the Lord and everywhere we go. I wish I did that. I get convicted preaching about it. But uh, it's there. It's if we decide to do it. He has revealed himself to us. We can reveal him to others. And because of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we even have more than the 70 do. Because this was a special dispensation for that assignment. But after Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God abides with us. Praise the Lord. But don't start considering yourself wise and prudence. Then everything... If, a, if you're in a ministry and your authority as a leader goes to your head, and I've seen it, I trust I haven't been very guilty of it myself, but you, for, you forget that you're a nobody who just got saved by grace. You gotta, no matter where you're at, you gotta remember that. I'm a nobody. I'm just glad to have my name in heaven. And if you do get proud, then you can take yourself out of the running for any further revelation. Okay, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. Oh, it's 5-2. Do we want to do the whole Samaritan yet? Yeah. Say yes or no. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's do it. A certain lawyer stood up and asked, tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to 
inherit eternal life. And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your strength and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Now he wanted to justify himself. I'm, this is how I see it, and well, that's what it says, right? That's the first two commandments, the great commandments. Love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, he understood the first two commandments. But who is his neighbor? That's what the parable goes on to talk about. But wanting to justify himself, he said, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, he's expecting him to say, he's a Jewish guy next door. But he says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Ooh, I don't want to go around that guy. He's, in, he's a mess. Likewise, a Levite. Now the priest is a fully-fledged descendant of Aaron, a priest, with uh, responsibilities in the temple and the local synagogues. A Levite is any of the tribe of Levi, but and a lot of them were also further educated and honored. Sub-priests, as it were. But he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, remember the hostility between the Samaritans and the Jews, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of the three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Mm -hmm. Alas, all mankind is my neighbor. Mm -hmm. I can't pick a race a religious belief. Oh, you're a Catholic. I really don't yet. You Catholics have done so much trouble in this world. I'm not going to. Most of the people we've led to the Lord were originally Catholics. We can't pick and choose. Everybody that crosses our path is potentially our neighbor, especially if there's an open door and if there's a need that we can fix. Amen. Amen.